jurisprudence and the current state of affairs of the judiciary of India uh, and where is India heading as a democracy. Honorable Justice Markande Kaju is the son of late Justice uh, S.N. Kaju, former judge um, of Allahabad High Court. And, uh, you know, um, uh, we are honored to have you here, sir. Uh, so please, um, I would ask you to deliver your keynote um, address and also your speech uh, uh, on the topic given today. So uh, we welcome you, Markande Justice Kaju. Uh, uh, Justice uh, Supreme Court of India. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, is it morning there or is it evening? What is the time there? It's a morning so time, sir. Sorry? Morning. It's I morning. Can't hear you. It's morning, sir. Uh, it's around morning. Like, oh, okay, yes. so, so yeah. good morning to you. It's night here in Delhi. Now, as you all know, uh, the Indian Constitution was made on 26 January 1950. And our Constitution makers incorporated a chapter called Fundamental Rights in it, which was based on the U.S. Bill of Rights, incorporating the rights in the US Bill of Rights, like the right to liberty, equality, uh, freedom of religion, and uh, freedom of speech, etc. Now, no doubt, uh, uh, we, uh, these fundamental rights were incorporated in the Constitution, which, and these, these were not there in the earlier Constitution of India, which was the Government of India Act 1935, which was uh, really uh, made under British rule. There was no fundamental rights in the Government of India Act 1935. It was something new in the, in the Indian Constitution, uh, this chapter on fundamental rights. Now, these rights were said to be guaranteed rights. And, uh, but somebody had to be there to enforce those, those rights. Otherwise, they are all on paper. They mean nothing. So it was the Supreme Court which was declared to be the custodian of the Constitution and guardian of the fundamental rights of the people. It was the duty of the Supreme Court and the High Courts to protect citizens from uh, invasion of these rights by the executive or even by the it's legislative authorities. You see, all these rights were in all the groups. based on an article written uh, by John Locke in 1690 called The Second Treatise on Civil Government in 1690 in which John Locke, the British political thinker, said that there are certain rights which even the king cannot invade, even parliament cannot invade, they are because they are inherent in human nature. So uh, all the uh, uh, fundamental rights, bill of rights, or declaration of rights of man in the French uh, constitution, in the French revolution, all these emanate from one article called the Second Treatise on C Civil Government, written in 1690 by the British political scholar, John Locke. And therefore, th th this, uh, these rights in the Indian constitution were said to be rights even against the legislature, not just against the executive. Even the legislature cannot invade them. But there must be somebody to enforce those rights. Otherwise, they, it's just a piece of paper. It means nothing. So the, it, it was the judiciary, particularly the Supreme Court and the High Courts, which were the which were meant to be protectors of the liberties of the citizens and the fundamental rights. And for quite some time they were protecting it, although it must be said to the shame of the Indian Supreme Court that in the Misa judgment, ADM Jabalpur judgment of 1976, the Supreme Court shamelessly said that the citizen has no right to life or liberty. He can be just caught hold and shot during an emergency. 
Of course, there was one brave dissent by Justice H. R. Khanna, but otherwise the other four judges all caved in. They but surrendered to Indira Gandhi. Similar thing has been happening in recent years. That uh, the Indian judiciary, particularly the Supreme Court, is totally failing in its duty to enforce the rights of the people. Like Bhish Pitama, who turned a blind eye when Draupadi was being disrobed. So also our Supreme Court is just ignoring what you know. You know what is happening in India? This is what I call in Hindi "ulti ganga the, the 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 innocent people are being sent to jail, and the guilty people are roaming around free. I'll give you examples. You have of course heard of the lynching uh, lynching of uh, Pehlu Khan, Tabrez, Ansari. Ikhlaq and so on. Muslims lynched with impunity by so-called Gaurakshaks. And in fact, one minister, Mr. Jain Sinha, he went and garlanded some of the lynchers. Then what is happening is that innocent people are being sent to jail. For example, there is a pregnant uh, Kashmiri young woman, Safura Zargar. She was very active in the movement against the Citizenship Amendment Act. Now, there's nothing wrong in, in, uh, in speaking out against the law, if one feels it is a wrong law. After all, what is democracy? In fact, I can tell you just a few months after the Indian Constitution was made on 26 January 1950, uh, Five judge bench, constitution bench of the Indian Supreme Court gave a very important judgment called Ramesh Thapar versus State of Madras, in which the Indian Supreme Court said that in a democracy, people have the right to criticize the government. This was just said a few months after the constitution was made in 1950. But now it has become dangerous to criticize the government. So, Safura Azargar is in jail, of course, uh, on trumped up, trumped up charges that she was inciting communal hatred and communal violence, which is all fake charges. You know, in, in India, the police often fabricate charges. They will create false evidence and fabricate charges. That is what the real reason is that she's a Muslim and she was against this Citizenship Amendment Act. Similarly, Dr. Khafil Khan is a medical doctor, eminent doctor. He spoke against this Citizenship Amendment Act. He, in jail, still in jail for many months. And similarly, Shajil Imam, etc., they all in jail. And I can tell you the, the, the people who were lynched, like Ikhlaq and Pehlu Khan and so on, their relatives are being victimized. Criminal cases have been filed against against their, their relatives. I mean, the victims are being prosecuted, while the, uh, the perpetrators are roaming around free. Similarly, you know, there were massacres of Muslims in Delhi, so-called Delhi riots in Northeast Delhi, where Muslim, Muslims were killed. Then there's, there's, there's a politician called Kapil Mishra, who's in the BJP. He is well known. He incited those riots of one of the persons. And there's a, there's a minister, Anurag Thakur. He, in a public, you can see on YouTube, he in a meeting said, Desh ke gaddaron ko, and the crowd sh shouted, Goli maro salon ko. So it's incitement to murder. And he has not been charged, charged cheated. Kapil Mishra has not been, they, they are roaming around free. So, as I said, ulti ganga the, the, the innocent are, being, are in jail and the guilty are roaming around free. This is the same. Now, here is where the judiciary becomes very important. It was the duty to, uh, of the judiciary to see that the rights of the citizens were not violated. But the judiciary has caved in. I mean, if some of them see how shamelessly the Chief Justice of India, Gogoi, behaved. It surrendered before the uh, uh, BJP government. There's another very senior judge, Arun Mishra. He openly said in a public function 
that Prime Minister Modi is a visionary and a genius and all. I mean, see, you may have your private opinions, but for a judge to openly say, what message does it send to the public? That this judiciary is not independent. It is not neutral. It is just a chamcha of the, of the government. It will do whatever the government tells them to do. When the government, when the judges have taken an oath to uphold the constitution, are they not violating their oath? They are being paid salaries out from the taxes paid by the public. Do they deserve this, those salaries and huge perks which are, they are getting? After all, you have to do your duty to the nation. But are they doing their duty to the nation? Unfortunately, see what is happening in India is that law and order has you know, totally disappeared. For example, uh, I have given many examples. This, uh, uh, there is one professor Ambikesh Mahapatra of Jadapur University. He had shared some cartoon on the social media about Mamta Banerjee. For that, he was charged, arrested for sedition and criminal cases and all the filed against him. Similarly, there was one cartoonist in Bombay, Asim Trivedi. He uh, put up a cartoon on the social media that politicians are corrupt. And he was arrested and char charged for sedition and so on. Then uh, a large number of such uh, cases had, uh, can be given of people. There was one uh, folk singer, Kovan, in Tamil Nadu. He uh, spoke that Jalata is doing corruption in liquor business, and he was arrested and put into jail. So if you speak against the government, it is dangerous now. When really in a democracy, a Supreme Court itself had said in Ramesh Thapar's case, as far back as 1950, that in a democracy, people have the right to criticize the government. But nowadays, it has become dangerous to criticize the government. A very important judgment was given by a single judge of Madras High Court very recently, Justice Kuddos. And he said that uh, people have a right to criticize the government and the author public authority should be thick-skinned. They should not mind being criticized. But nowadays, these people, these politicians are so touchy and they have such a short fuse. If you criticize them, they, they go wild and they slap criminal charges against you. Again, against journalists, for example, there is a journalist, Kishore Chand Wang Khem in Manipur. He wrote against the, something against the chief minister, Biren Singh. And immediately he was arrested. For several months, he was kept in jail just for criticizing the chief minister. Then there was a journalist, Pawan Jaiswal, in UP. He uh, wrote that in Mirzapur district in UP, in a primary school, the children are getting only uh, uh, roti and salt for midday meal. For that, sedition charge was imposed upon him and he was arrested. Then there was a, uh, there's a journalist, Dharavi Patel, in Gujarat. He brings out a portal called Face the Nation, in which he published that the chief minister may be replaced, chief minister of Gujarat. For that, sedition charge was uh, imposed on him and he was arrested. So what is all this going on? Then in the Bhima Koregaon accused the Supreme Court have caught, should have caused the prosecution relying on the Brandenburg decision. I don't know how many of you are aware of the decision of the U.S. Supreme Court in Brandenburg versus Ohio. Are any of you aware of it? You are law scholars and you don't know the law. Wonderful. You see, uh, uh, in Brandenburg versus Ohio of 1969, the U.S. Supreme Court laid down what is known as the imminent lawless action test. Imminent lawless action which means the speech or activity can be um, prohibited only if it is likely to result in imminent lawless action. Imminent means immediate, not in the remote. So uh, unless, uh, see, for example, in many parts of India, uh, people demand azadi, freedom. Uh, Kashmiris demand it, then Khalistanis demand it, many Nagas demand it. Now demanding azadi is not a crime itself. It's part of the freedom of speech, which is in Article 19.1a of the Indian Constitution. That's your fundamental right to demand azadi. Yes, if you go further and you commit violence 
or you organize violence or you incite to imminent lawless action, immediate lawless action, then it becomes a criminal activity. So that uh, test in Brandenburg versus Ohio of 1969, and that judgment, by the way, still holds the field in USA. Please read it. You people should start reading some law now also. That is the, the, the I, use, I, I use that, uh, I followed that judgment in Brandenburg versus Ohio in two judgments which I delivered in 2011. One was called Arup Bhuya versus State of Assam. Please note it down. And the other is called Sri Indra Das versus State of Assam. I mean, start, uh, uh, start some reading and learning something now. You don't need to be just professors and drawing salary for nothing. Now, see, in these decisions which I gave, Arup Bhuya versus State of Assam and Sri Indra Das versus State of Assam, I followed the Brandenburg test. And I said that that same test is to be applied in India too. But despite these two judgments, which I had myself given, they are not being followed. In Bhima, Koregaon, you know, people had been arrested and fake charges have been levied against. See, in India, what happens is the police often fabricates evidence. It is common knowledge. Even if you're innocent, they will, you know, create some evidence, fake evidence, and put it before the court. Oh, my Lord, see, he's such a terrorist. He's a um, brutal man. De they will demonize you. This is the tendency of the Indian police. I mean, Indian police is not fair. Police is meant to be fair. I mean, they, they are meant to present the correct facts before the court. Well, how, what can the court decide if the facts presented to the court themselves are not, not correct? After all, the court can't go and personally investigate. They have to rely on the facts uh, found by the police. But if the police manufactures concocts evidence, facts, then what judgment can the court give? So it all, you know, many of the judgments which I have said, that, you know, uh, the, the judgment in Abzal Guru's case and uh, there are many other cases. I said, see, if, uh, these, they rely on con uh, conspiracy, these conspiracy charges. In conspiracy cases, the evidence is either confession. Now, confession is such a thing that you, under torture, one will confess to everything. Joan of Arc confessed to be a witch under torture. You will confess to everything under torture. So that is the main evidence given in these, in, in these uh, conspiracy cases. And second evidence is there, there were some recoveries. Now recoveries are, you know, very often planted. Police is, in India can do anything. All kinds of uh, wrong things uh, Indian police very often does. So there is, there is no justice here in, in India. I mean, everything is toxic to me. Any, uh, you know, uh, charges can be, uh, for fake charges, you can be arrested. If you criticize the government, it is extremely dangerous. Uh, when it, it was the duty of the uh, court to protect the rights of the citizens. This was said as recent as in two constitution bench judgments one was Navtej Singh Johar versus Union of India. The other was Shakti Vahini versus Union of India. Both were given in 2018 by five judge constitution benches of the Indian Supreme Court. That it is uh, the, the, when there's a violation of a fundamental right, the court cannot be a mute spectator. Now they have said it, but they are not practicing what they have preached. In recent times, see, uh, so many violations uh, are taking place, illegalities are taking place, but our judiciary is turning a Nelson's eye to all these illegalities of the and arbitrariness and excesses of the executive. There's no justice. I mean, it, it, it's all now. Uh, I mean, I've lost all hope, sorry to say, in the Indian judiciary. Thank you. Now you can put any question. So, sir, uh, let Sharmila ji uh, unmute yourself, please. You have to unmute yourself. Sorry? 
You asking me? Uh, no, sir. No, no. no. Uh, I'm, I'm unmuting myself. I'm sorry. Okay. Good. Okay. So, um, just for the record, I do know about Brandenburg versus Ohio. Um, but um, now let's let's hear some questions. Sunita Vishwanath, you want to start? She's a co-founder of the Hindus for Human Rights. Um, yes. Thank, can you hear me, Sharmila and everyone? Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Justice G for being with us today. It's a real honor. And thank you for just all of your brave advocacy. Um, it's, it's, it's not a joke to speak as openly as you and some of the other advocates, frontline advocates, and we really appreciate it. Um, and also you've just um, given us a, a real sort of reality check of just how serious things are. And my question is one that I often bring up at our webinars, which is um, most of us who um, are on this call are abroad. And we all are very, we are of Indian origin, most of us, or maybe all of us, and we're very concerned. And the question is, what can we do? And one thing that Hindus for Human Rights, my organization does is participate in advocacy um, in spaces like the United Nations um, and the US government because we are in, in the US. And so I just wondered if you have any advice or opinion about what the international community can do to put pressure on India. Um, if there's any, if you feel, some people think there's no point. Some people think that's the only way that we can get anything done. I just wondered what your opinion was on international advocacy. Thank you. Now, uh, I have written an article called The Right to Investigate. Please note it down. The right, it, it's, you can go on Google and just type Justice Kadju, Right to Investigate. It was published in the portal indicanews.com. Now, let me tell you a little about, about this. Uh, you see, uh, the, the, there is a body called the uh, US Commission on uh, Religious. Uh, Freedom. Freedom. Religious, mm -hmm. international freedom or something. Now, they had said that uh, India is a country of concern because, you know, Muslims are being targeted, they are being lynched, and atrocities are being committed. They put it be, uh, they put, put in jail on uh, false charges and so on. So they said India is a country of concern. And they wanted to send a, a delegation to India to investigate. But the Indian government denied a visa. Now, I, I wrote an article along with a law student, Ayman Hashmi, which has been published, as I said, called The Right to Investigate, in which I said, see, the, have you heard of the Westphalian principle? You are a law professor, you don't know anything. Westphalian, I have to teach you the ABCD of law now. See, Westphalian principle was created after Peace of Westphalia in Germany in 1648, after the Thirty Years' War. Uh, in 1648, the Treaty of Westphalia was signed. Now, after that, the principle of international law which was created was that every state has absolute sovereignty over the affairs which go on within its country, and no foreign country can intervene in the internal affairs of any country. This is known as the Westphalian, please note it down, start learning some law, Westphalian principle. Now, this continued for a long time, but ultimately, see, when uh, horrible things happened uh, in Germany under the Nazi regime, they were, the Nazis were killing their own, the Jewish, their own citizens. Then after the Second World War, many uh, scholars of international law said that if we except the Westphalian principle, we will have to go to the extent of saying that the Hitler regime had the right to kill the Jews in Germany and nobody had a right to say anything about it. Logically, you, have, you will have to go to that extent. So they said, no, they, uh, if, if there's a humanitarian crisis within a country, then uh, other countries have a right to intervene. This was uh, a sort of a modification was sought to be made in the Westphalian principle, which is known as the post-Westphalian uh, order. Now, uh, but the criticism of this uh, post-Westphalian principle was that if we give the right to uh, intervene in our country, then uh, 
imperialist, then it will give a, a, a handle to imperialist countries to invade weak countries by saying, oh, there's a humanitarian crisis. So this is... A, Seems like our media had to be worked out, and we uh, have tried to develop it in this article called "The Right to Investigate," which I and Eman Hashmi, the law students of Delhi University, have written. Uh, hello, where? Yes, sir. Go ahead, please. Okay. okay. So uh, we said they may, there's no right to invade, but there's a right to investigate. So the the uh, America has no right to invade India, if, even if if uh, uh, the Indian government is persecuting Muslims or something. But certainly, uh, foreign countries have a right to investigate. I mean, otherwise you'll have to go to that to the extent of saying that nobody had a right to speak out when uh, Hitler was killing the Jews. Nobody had a right to speak because it was an internal affair of Germany. So there has to be some some limit to the uh, Westphalian principle. And we have tried to develop in this article the uh, a new principle, which is a sort of a middle gr ground, a uh, via media between the absolute Westphalian principle and uh, the right to, uh, to invade a, a country saying that there is a humanitarian crisis. We've said you have no right to invade, but you have a right to investigate. And therefore the denial of visa to the, mem the members of this delegation of this uh, US Commission on International uh, Religious Freedom, that was illegal. So my uh, request is you people, please uh, consider this article and you also uh, demand of the Indian government to permit this delegation to visit India. I mean, if, if, the, if the Indian government has nothing to hide, if, if it has done nothing wrong, then why should it uh, feel shy of allowing uh, this delegation to come and investigate allegations of uh, of uh, atrocities on minorities, and there's prima facie proof. Everybody knows Ikhlaq was murdered, Pehlu Khan was murdered, and uh, Tabrez Ansari they were murdered, lynched by uh, mobs. Everybody knows it, and large number of other cases also. And what is happening to uh, um, Safura Zarga for several months? That pregnant Kashmiri young lady is in jail on trumped up charges that she was trying to incite uh, communal violence. Obviously, it is all of fake, you know, our police can do any kind of devilish things, like uh, creating false evidence, fabricating evidence. Uh, you see, our police is no longer independent. It will do whatever the political masters tell them to do, it will do like a slave. Unfortunately, in fact, uh, I can tell you, uh, former Chief Justice of India, Justice Lodha, said that the CBI is a caged parrot. This was the expression he used about the top investigating agency, CBI. He said it is a caged parrot. So they will do anything, whatever the political masters tell them to do, they will do. Thank you, and Justice before... Kadju. Thank you. The, the, Mr. Rajagopal, do you have a question now? He's from also from Hindus for Human Rights. Uh. Justice Kaju, thank you so much. A uh, lot of the facts that you enumerated, uh, many of them we are aware of, but to hear from someone of your stature underscoring those issues is a very, very important milestone for some of us here in NRS. Uh, for the record, unfortunately, we don't have too many lawyers on this panel, but I think your call, of, uh, call for action perhaps should motivate us to get more uh, Indian American lawyers to the table to work with people like you, where we have intersection of issues between the US and, uh, and India. Uh, I also want to briefly mention to you, since you talked about USERF, uh, our group, Hindus for Human Rights, is very actively engaged with USERF. We are one of the few Hindu groups that publicly supported USERF recommendation. And we continue to follow that up, not only with them, uh, also with Congress people, but your specific detail that you gave about the visa and the Westerian order is extremely important. And we will go learn about it and see what we can do about it. I have just one question, which may seem somewhat academic, given your feeling of how badly things are even at the Supreme Court. 
Uh, and this is to do with the fundamental right to privacy. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, last year or a year and a half ago spent one of the longest hearings on whether privacy was a fundamental right. And they finally ruled that it indeed was. And it was celebrated by many people who had petitioned the Supreme Court in the context of Aadhaar. But my own view was, while they were celebrating those judgments, the rear door was completely wide open, which is NPR and uh, uh, CAA and other things where there is no, uh, whatever the judgments were made, made in the context of Aadhaar, can be completely ignored in the case of NPR. So my question uh, is if there is still a possibility of civil society using that judgment of privacy being a fundamental right, is there sim still any hope for us to go back to the Supreme Court and use that judgment to throw out NPR? Thank you, sir. Frankly, I have lost confidence in this Supreme Court. The way they have been behaving recently is shameful. For example, let me give you one or two examples. As you know, in Kashmir on 5th August, uh, there was abrog abrogation of Article 370. And uh, many uh, politicians of Kashmir were arrested. And, and by the way, most of them were, uh, or a large number of them were those who were pro-India, like Farooq Abdullah, Umar Abdullah, Mehbooba Mukti and all. Uh, and some of them are still under arrest. This was in, just after 5th August. Now habeas corpus petitions were filed in the Supreme Court. Now habeas corpus petition means a petition directed against illegal arrest. They have priority over every other thing. See, when a habeas corpus petition is filed before a British judge, then he sets aside all other files, puts them all aside. He said, this case has priority over every other case because it relates to individual liberty. It is so sacrosanct. And within a couple of weeks, the case is decided. But what happened in, in the Indian Supreme Court? Soon after 5th August, these people were arrested, Farooq Abdullah, Umar Abdullah and so on and habeas corpus petitions were filed challenging the arrest. Those petitions were post adjourned month after month, month after month. Are you decided this way or that way, whatever you want to, but they would not decide it. And many of them are still pending. In fact, not a single one has been decided as yet. It's another matter that uh, Farooq Abdullah and Umar Abdullah have been released, but that uh, was, release was not by the court, but by the government itself. But what was the judiciary doing? What was, was it not their duty to decide those habeas corpus petitions? Whatever they wanted to decide, this way or that way. But they would not take a decision. So evidently they were doing the bidding of the uh, political leaders. They will do whatever the government tells. The government must have said, you keep postponing, adjourning. This is, what, is it not shameful behavior? That you are not abiding by your oath. You have taken an oath. Supreme Court and High Court judges have to take oath. I have taken oath to uphold the Constitution, which means uphold liberty, which is in Article 21. But it, it, you are violating that oath. You are, you are not enforcing the fundamental rights of the people. You are not up, uh, acting as a custodian of the Constitution. So, so then uh, what, what, what is the meaning of your oath? And So it is very, very unfortunate and sad performance of the Indian Supreme Court. They buckled down. This uh, Ranjan Gogoi, who was Chief Justice of India, shameful man. And ultimately, he was rewarded for doing the bidding of the government by being made a member of parliament, as you would be knowing. Similarly, there was a senior judge, Arun Mishra. He openly said, in a public function, oh, this Prime Minister Modi is a genius. He's a uh, versatile genius and visionary and all this. In a, in a public function for a senior Supreme Court judge to say this, what message goes? The message goes that this institution is not independent. It is just a chamcha of the government. Whatever the government will tell them to do, they will do. So this is the behavior. I'm not saying all of the judges, but a large number of them. Thank you, Justice. Thank you. I have. 
I have a question right now. Now, if you if you say that you've lost hope, still there are lawyers that have to go before the court and make their arguments. What are the, some of the possible things they could do in order to get judgments more or less in favor of their clients and for fundamental rights? Um, the courts haven't shut down. So is there no hope or is there some hope of, of phrasing things in such a way that perhaps they can be granted? Are you asking what should the lawyers do? Yes, I am. In my opinion, uh, the lawyers should file collectively a comprehensive petition in the Supreme Court in which they should give all these instances where uh, the rights of the citizens have been violated and people are in jail or in, uh, being oppressed and tell the Supreme Court that now please uh, do your duty to uphold the rights of the citizens instead of just abdicating your duty. Now, if the time has come, you must do your duty. Otherwise, you resign and go. Why are you getting salaries? For what purpose are you, you judges getting salaries when you can't do your duty? So you must do your duty. And they have been done. If you read my article, I've written two articles which I sent to your uh, uh, anchor. One, one, uh, one, the title of one is uh, the Supreme Court must uh, resume its role of protector of the rights of the people. And the title of the other one is all the time the Supreme Court turned a Nelson's eye to injustice. And in these articles, I have given uh, reference to a large number of Supreme Court judgments, which have said that the Supreme Court is a custodian of the Constitution and protector of the rights of the people. But they are not following their own judgments. There are dozens of judgments which have said that it is the duty of the Supreme Court to protect the liberties of the citizens. But the uh, late the Supreme Court is ignoring its own judgments and judgment by very large benches. You please read all the uh, all, all the uh, references are in my articles. So uh, uh, my reply to you is that the lawyers should get together and file a comprehensive petition in the Supreme Court, saying that you have to now start doing your duty. You can't keep on uh, turning a blind eye to all the illegalities and uh, excesses and arbitrariness of the executive. It's very, very sad. Do, this is what the, believe, my suggestion to the lawyers is. Do you believe that collective action is going to succeed or has a probability of succeeding more than petition by petition approaches that individual lawyers can take? Yes, a, a collective petition will put more pressure and they should, uh, a large number of lawyers should get together. Because after all, you know, the uh, credibility of the institution has sunk to a very low level. People of India have no faith in the judiciary. And in my, my own opinion is the uh, Indian judiciary is beyond redemption. Some diseases can be cured by medicines and some like some kind of cancer can't be cured. So in my own opinion, the Indian judiciary has got cancer of the in incurable variety. Because see, what kind of judiciary is it which takes 20, 30 years to decide a case finally? Most, many cases take 20, 20, 30, 40 years. You know, is it a judiciary or a joke? And then a large section of the judges have become corrupt. I'm not saying every judge is corrupt, but a large section of them have become corrupt. What kind of judiciary is it which takes 20, 30? I mean, if you are a young woman, you want a divorce from your husband. Obviously, you want to get remarried. But if it takes 20, 30 years for your divorce petition to be decided in appeal and second appeal, your hair will turn white. And then what use will, uh, will that divorce uh, be to you because you can't can hardly get remarried at that old age. So it, it, in Allahabad High Court, my parent High Court, criminal appeals which were filed in the High Court 30 years ago are coming up for hearing today. Can you, can you believe it? Criminal appeals against the judgments of district courts, which were filed 30 years ago, are coming up for hearing today. In Bombay High Court, the original uh, suits uh, are pending for 20 years or so. so. Who has got time for 20 years and 30 years? So the uh, judiciary in India has become a joke. It's all, uh, I mean, uh, it's all very good for lawyers to make money and judges to get salary, but it's not serving the people. And the judiciary is beyond redemption. See, certain, certain diseases can be cured, certain diseases cannot be cured. 
my own I, and mind you i have been 20 years lawyer and 20 year a judge and, and at very high levels and i am saying this that the indian judiciary is beyond redemption no amount of now uh, reform can do anything justice kadju thank you um dr jamil do you have a question he's from um indian americans forum so thank you for your uh, insightful uh, uh speech uh justice i have a quick question uh, i guess you answered a little bit and i know that there is uh, you know repeated uh, um you know thing being said about the supreme court of india i want to know from you as a jurist and uh, uh you know whether the supreme court has any standard of procedure when it comes to um taking a suo moto notice on the events of um any event going on um do they have any standard of procedures where they can take a suo moto notice and the part two of my question is whether there is a supreme judicial council like that of in another country who monitors this judges thank you see uh, supreme court has power to take suo moto cognizance of uh, illegality and it should when such gross illegalities are taking place on, on such a wide scale like uh, uh, lynching of muslims or uh, you know arresting people just because they have criticized the government in a democracy people have a right to criticize the government what else is democracy but large number of people are arrested the moment you criticize then sedition charges uh, levied against you and you are arrested and all so so moto cognizance should be taken by supreme court and and in fact uh, i have said a heavy fine should be imposed on authorities who are doing these illegalities so that exemplary fine should be imposed of lakhs and crores of rupees on these authorities who are you know arresting people see a, a person's right to freedom is a very uh, basic right but if you are somebody just comes and arrest you because you have criticized the government so then that right or right of liberty is violated so for that heavy punishment should be given by the judiciary but they, i have no faith in that they will never do it thank you justice kadju i have a question from a um, from motika anand she wants to know if there's any international court or any other body where we can appeal for release, release of prisoners in india political prisoners like kapil khan safura zargar sudha bhardwaj is there any pressure that we can put through an international body in order to get public opinion or even the government to to accede to our request to release these people no i did not follow your question what was your question my question is 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 there any international body to which one can appeal which will perhaps motivate the government to release the indian government to release these so called political prisoners the uh, international body to whom you can appeal against what against the continued incarceration in jail of people like safura zarwa no there there is no uh, body you can appeal to because uh, uh, see india is a sovereign country uh, no foreign court can uh, can can uh, uh, sit in appeal over judgments of the indian supreme court what if the last the highest court is the supreme court so you, there is no power of uh, no right to appeal to foreign bodies but certainly as i said foreign countries can investigate the the uh, violation of uh, rights of minorities and so on uh, we cannot say that indian government cannot say that nobody we we, we will uh, oppress our minorities but nobody should speak out against it that is no longer permissible after what happened in the nazi regime because otherwise then 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 you have to permit uh, the nazis to massacre jews in germany on the ground that this is their internal matter and they have such sovereignty so that absolute westphalian principle cannot be accepted nowadays so people have the right to investigate and having investigated that uh, will be Uh, then uh, publicized and it will put pressure on the indian government that look you are doing something uh, against the 
modern values that minorities have minorities cannot be uh, oppressed or uh, victimized this is against uh, the universal declaration of human rights and various uh, international pronouncements that you can't uh, a, a country cannot uh, oppress its minorities or any section of its people with impunity so certainly an invest right to investigate is there as i said thank you justice kadju um i now call on dr rehan khan of the international society for peace and justice dr khan are you online Sorry, yes i can hear you please uh, this dr rehan khan is from the international society for peace and justice please ask your question dr khan okay all right thank you uh, justice kadju uh, we are very happy and we are glad and i want to let you know that india is alive and well because of the people like you i don't know what we will do if the people like you are not there uh, and reminding the government of their and the supreme court of their responsibilities my question is regarding uh, babri masjid decision in their babri masjid decision they did mention that the demolition of the masjid was a criminal act then why no punishment was handed over by the supreme court for a criminal act and we already know who the perpetrators were we already have firs against them if you want to comment on that and the second part of the question is about the right to investigate how can somebody investigate if the government of in is not even allow uh, uscirf you mentioned is an independent body it does not have it is not republican or democrat i want your comment thank you see for the question about the babri masjid verdict yeah. yes in my opinion it was a shameful verdict of the indian supreme court supreme court did gave the verdict at the bidding of the government it was a wholly illegal verdict because on the one hand they say that demolition of the masjid was illegal but on the other hand they don't do anything about it so uh, that was a shameful verdict and all five judges i'm sorry to say all surrendered before the government at least in the adm jabalpur case there was one brave dissent of justice hr khanna here there was not a single uh, brave dissent all buckled in because th there was obviously there was pressure of the government it was just at the instance of the government it was a shameful verdict i have written an article on it that this will go down as another black it will worse than the adm jabalpur verdict as regards this uh, right to investigate i only if you read my article everything will become clear please i would request you to read my article called the right to investigate published in the portal indicanews.com i have explained there if you read it then in fact i had um, uh, everything will become clear on reading it people don't the foreign country don't have a right to invade india on the pretext that uh, in indian government is, is is oppressing minorities but certainly foreign countries have a right to investigate if there's cr credible prima facie evidence and there is can anybody doubt that pehlu khan was lynched or that ikhlaq was lynched or that tabrez and sari was lynched and i can give a dozen names of Muslims who were lynched by so-called these uh, cow vigilantes, alleging that these people were carrying beef or whatever nonsense. So, so uh, there's certainly a right to investigate. Otherwise, you'll be uh, if you accept the absolute Westphalian principle, then you logically have to go to the extent of saying that Hitler had a right to murder all his Jews and nobody had a right to say anything about it. can you accept that in the modern world so we have to modify that westphalian principle and in my opinion the correct modification is that there is right to investigate 
No country can say that I will do anything to our minorities. What is happening in Pakistan to the Ahmadis? They are, they are being treated barbarically by the Muslim majority. Barbarically they have been treated. So many times they have been in Lahore in 2010, I think 100 of them were massacred and then the laws were made against them that they can't call their place of worship a masjid and they, if they post to be a Muslim, they will be put in jail. They have to, when they apply for a passport, these Ahmadis have to say that our leader Mirza Ghulam Ahmad was, a, was an imposter. Just imagine they are being, they are, they are, they have, they are humiliated by making uh, that, by forcing them to make a declaration that the person whom they hold in such high respect, they have to say he, he, he was an imposter. This is how uh, uh, Ahmadis are treated in Pakistan. So, same, same thing is, which is happening in India is happening in Pakistan. So people have a right to investigate there also, in Pakistan also. What is this uh, barbarism which is going on? Therefore, I said that there should be a right to investigate. Thank you, Justice. Uh, Mr. Ram Jalla, do you have a question? He's from the Indian Americans Forum too. Um, yeah, sure. Um, Kadju Saf, thank you. It's a pleasure to uh, listening to you. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I think it's pretty common nowadays. Um, the question regarding to anti-defection law. So in sense, if, with regards to you know Indian assemblies today, the anti-defection law, it's become useless. And, and my question is, uh, in what level court can uh, interfere to correct this? And when we go to you know high courts and then they were saying it's a hands of speaker, but speaker is elected, I mean, are appointed by the ruling governments and you know they are not acting. Um, I can take the same example what you gave. So if young widow is asking for a divorce and the after 50 years his verdict is coming, so the five years tenure of assembly MLA, we go for dismissal. So even after five years of his tenure is not getting. So what level can courts give a pressure on them? What are you trying to say? I can't make head or tail out of what you are trying to say. <laughs> Please be clear. Get your head clear first. You don't know what you are trying to say. I can't make head or tail out of what you are saying. Okay. Please, when you say two plus two is equal to four, say it clearly. Two plus two is four. Don't say it may be four, it may be five. What are you trying to say? Tell me. Uh, what what is the role of... And in short, don't don't make it very long. Don't give me a lecture. Your set question should be short and brief and, and simple so that I can understand and then answer. I sure, can't I can... even understand what you, you are saying. How can I answer you when I can't understand you? Okay. Uh, in sense so of... You are so muddle-headed. You don't even know what you are trying to say. You don't even know your own mind. You don't know what you want to say. Be clear first. First clarify your mind and then talk. <clears throat> I, like, I, I like intelligent people. Not muddle-headed people. Yes, what do you want to say? Uh, I want to. I want your reaction on anti-defection law in sense of state assembly. On anti-defection law. Yeah. You want my reaction on anti-defection law? Yeah. See, anti-defection law has made no. Uh, see, politics in India has gone to such a low level. You have seen what is happening in in Rajasthan. The co Congress has alleged that. Uh, the BJP are trying to poach the Congress MLAs by bribing them. Uh, the Chief Minister Ashok Gehlot has said that each Congress MLA who is sought to be bribed is being offered 25 crore rupees. So those uh, MLAs, uh, Congress MLAs have been taken to some resort so that they are not poached. <coughs> This is the level of Indian politics. I mean, it, 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 Indian politics is at a very, very low level. Politicians in India, I'm sorry to say, of all parties, are a bunch of rogues and rascals and gundas. They have no genuine love for the country. They are only out for power and pelf. So, uh, defection will take place some way. This anti defection law and all, you see, it is all meaningless. Politics had gone to a very low level. Congress is accusing that BJP is trying to poach our MLAs in Rajasthan. But what did the Congress do when it was in power? Did it not do the same thing? Is, is, there, is, is anybody from Andhra Pradesh here sitting in this group? Is there anybody from Andhra Pradesh in this group? Uh, I am from Telangana. Uh, but, uh, now you know what happened when N.T. Rama Rao was the chief minister, 
Then Indira Gandhi tried to poach MLAs and, and make, a, she made uh, some, and Bhaskar Rao is chief minister or something. So same thing Congress was doing. Indira, it was Indira Gandhi who started this, uh, you know, uh, what is called real politics, politics without any ethics. Now in politics in India, it is like Machiavelli. No, no ethics. It is just power and pelf. From the time of Indira Gandhi, in there, there's no uh, morality in politics, no ethics. So uh, now, the, what will you do with anti-defection law and all that? And there's nothing. I mean, the, very sad. Um, uh, Mr. Narsing Mumindia, is that am I pronouncing it correctly? He has a question. He's from Indian American Forum. Can you hear me? Can you unmute your? Can you Are you asking me something? Yeah, there was a question from Mr. Mamindia, but he he's on mute and he I'm asking him Nursing to unmute. Nursingji, unmute yourself. Nursingji. I what we is cannot this hear question? you. You have to we, unmute. Uh, we what we don't know question? yet because he's on mute. If you just wait a minute, he'll unmute himself. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes. now yes. we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Now we can. Yeah, Karju sir, I am a very और आपके पूरे YouTube में मैंने वीडियोस देखा और आपके ब्लॉग भी मैंने पढ़ा एक साल के पहले एक साल पीछे I know you are so frustrated and that shows how much you love the country and I really appreciate your frankness in all your speeches and articles मेरा क्वेश्चन शॉर्ट है कि um, I know that uh, when politicians and bureaucrats, uh, they collude and they do favors to each other and uh, they violate the constitution. So there should, is there a law or there should be something which can check on that? At least if the government changes, any government comes later, they should be able to uh, prosecute these people who listen to uh, uh, willfully uh, violated the constitution by Satisfying, satisfying their politician, political bosses, uh, going against the constitution and uh, hampering the uh, constitutions. So, there, unless there is a punishment to those kind of things, uh, it is going to be a nexus between the politicians and the bureaucrats, and they can do anything. So, is there any law today to prosecute those people who are going against the uh, constitution and favoring the politicians? Uh, those kind of things. I want. I want to know. Listen, let me tell you in very brief that everything has collapsed in India and India is heading for a revolution. And let me elaborate on this. If you read one article, you please note down what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Please note down an article of mine called Why Celebrate Republic Day When the Constitution Has Become a Scarecrow. Got it? Yeah, yeah, got it. Now, later on, you please read the whole of it. Mm -hmm. And what I mentioned there is everything has collapsed in India. If all our state institutions have become hollow, whether parliament or judiciary or bureaucracy, there's nothing left in, the, in them. And on the other hand, the distress of the people is growing. Poverty is increasing. Uh, unemployment has reached record levels. Healthcare is in shambles, the appalling level of child mal malnourishment, seven individuals in India, seven individuals in India are owning more wealth than the bottom half of the 1.35 billion population of India. Now, just consider this, seven individuals are owning as much if not more wealth than the bottom half of 1.35 billion people of India. Now, is this acceptable? Is this state of affairs acceptable? So, it, India is heading for a revolution. No, nothing can be, everything is finished. This constitution has exhausted itself. Now, I don't see anything. And how the revolution will come? Who will be the leaders? How much time it will take? All this is impossible to predict. Because you cannot be rigid about historical forms. But this much is certain that some alternative will emerge. You see, nature does not like a vacuum. See, what has happened? Your constitution uh, has the system.
democracy. Okay? Now, what is parliamentary democracy in India? In fact, it means largely caste and communal vote banks. 90% people in India, when they go to vote, they don't see the candidate's uh, merit, whether he's a good man, bad man, educated, uneducated, criminal, honest, nothing. Blindly, they go and vote on the basis of caste and religion, like sheep and cattle. 90%, I'm not saying 100%. Now, this is, therefore, I have no faith in uh, democracy. Democracy means majority vote and majority consists of castes and communal people who will, who will, uh, uh, whose mindset is feudal. How can they uh, take the country forward? See, uh, casteism and communalism are feudal forces which have to be destroyed if the country is to progress. But parliamentary democracy further entrenches them because it is based on casteism and communalism. So you have to have, find an alternative to parliamentary democracy. And that means you have to go outside the constitutional framework, which means you have to have a revolution, some kind of revolution. You can't, uh, India can't progress within this framework. And let me tell you one thing. In recent years, the Indian economy has tanked. Indian economy is sinking. One of the indicators of the health of the economy is the auto sector. In the auto sector, there are 40-50% sales decline in India. You can see on Google. And it's for, in this, this uh, COVID lockdown has further sent the Indian economy hurtling downwards. So the terrible times have come in India. The, there's massive uh, recession, massive unemployment. And you see, when th there's an economic crisis, then fascist tendencies I, uh, tend to come in. Uh, as uh, you can uh, know the you know the historical example of Italy in 1922 when the fascists came to power under Mussolini, or in Germany in 1933 when Hitler came to power. So th this shows that when the there's an economic crisis, then fascist tendencies tend to arise, and this is what has happened in India. And that is why now freedom and all is all gone to the wind in India. Now, if you dare to speak out publicly against the government, you are invited in trouble for yourself. Very possible you may be arrested and, uh, on, Trump, on fabricated charges. Police will fabricate. They will do whatever the political leaders will tell them to do. The police will manufacture all kinds of fake, fake allegations against you and uh, paint you as a terrorist and... Uh, bomb thrower and what, anything, they can fabricate any kind of charge. So democracy is, as it is, it was, it was a fake democracy, but now it is totally, it has collapsed. Because, because the economic crisis has come and in which the rulers cannot afford the luxury of permitting freedoms. They will crush whatever little freedoms there are because those freedoms will be used to, you know, um, organize protests and demonstrations. When there's massive economic crisis, there's bound to be a reaction among the people in the form of massive demonstrations and protests. So to crush that, the rulers are bound to resort to dictatorial and fascist methods. And that is what is happening in India. Uh, yes. Doctor, thank you, Doc, uh, Justice Kadju. Dr. Jamil, do you have a bunch of questions that have been sent to you on Google Forms that you Sorry? can ask. Dr. Jamil, do, do yeah, you have yeah. questions that you would like to ask from other people who have been sent to you, which have been sent to you? Oh, uh, actually, I sent it to you in your email. Uh, okay, the okay, fine. Then, then, then I can, uh, then I can ask them. Sure. Um, this is a question on Prime Minister Modi. Now, in the Godra case, he was apparently acquitted of charges, though I don't think there was actually a trial, but in any case, that's the question. Can the case be taken up in an international court of law for crimes against humanity? And the questioner is asking you. No, you can't because uh, see, in international court of law, only when a country gives consent, then only uh, it can have jurisdiction. So you can't go to the international uh, uh, the court of justice. So, but let me tell you, leave aside that, that issue. I, I am very disappointed with you NRIs who are living in America and 
continent, other Western country. You know, I, I thought you people are educated, you people are, you should be uh, more modern. But I was in America for six months from uh, last uh, September to March this year. And I, I was mainly in the Bay Area of California. I found that most of you are uh, polarized. And you educated people, you behave like stupid people. I mean, uh, just imagine Mr. Modi had a, held a meeting, uh, Howdy Modi in, uh, in Texas, uh, in Houston. How, how do you move you? Know? I think uh, 15,000 Indians went there. Yeah. And Mr. Modi repeatedly said, sub -thik. in many languages he said, in Hindi, sub hai. In, in Punjabi he said, changa hai. In Bengali, something similar. Uh, in Tamil also, in several languages, he said everything is all right in India. Not one out of you 15,000 people had the moral courage to say, Mr. Modi, what you are saying is not correct. How are you saying everything is all right when the economy is crashing, economy is sinking, the auto sector is collapsing, the IT sector is collapsing, there's record unemployment. How are you saying everything is all right? Not one of, and you people are educated, you, you don't have any morality. You don't have no ethics. You can't speak the truth and you are living in America. I mean, you are supposed to be the more educated class who has migrated to America. But I, I, I find you people are jokers. You people have, have no ethics. You people have, have no, no uh, uh, conscience. You have no brains. You have nothing in you. I, it just, of course, you are very good in your job. If you learn IT information technology, you'll get a job in the Bay Area. You're good in your technical job. Otherwise, you're all zero, politically zero. Anybody can take you for a ride. You're a bunch of fools. Most of you NRIs, I regard you as a bunch of fools. Any, any uh, crook can take you for a ride like a pipe piper of Hamlin, like rats, you will start following him. Well, you are polarized. Me... I, know I found the, the, the Hindu Indians in the Bay Area, 90% of them have, them have become pro-Modi, have become pro-BJP. Well, this is your me... level. I'm sorry to say, let... I have no respect for you. I, I don't expect anything for you. Yes, you enjoy a comfortable life. You are li living let, a comfortable let, life. Let me... But let don't me... give us lectures. Please, let me you, interrupt. You, you let me interrupt India. you. You are not Indians. Yeah. You have no just, love for India. Just, you have no respect for India. You only you you have become polarized. Ninety percent of you I found in the Bay Area where they are supposed to be you know the bright people of India. Uh, Justice in Kadju, let, let me interrupt you. Let me interrupt you for a moment. There are people who do dissent no, against that. The ninety. I'm talking about ninety percent. There are yes, well, ten percent. There may be who are honest. 90% of you are have no ethics. Nine, I, there are, well, you are right, there are, but there are only 10%. 90% of you have no ethics. I have no respect for you. Well, that's, I, 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 have, I, 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 if, I don't believe if, in uh, interacting with you. You have no, no ethics. First requirement is the man well, must have ethics. He must, must well, have honesty. Ob obviously, right, right I found 90% of you had become polarized in the Bay Area. I found it. And you, where you are, people are from Chicago. I suppose the same thing would be there also. Well, the, the problem is that of course, right? just, just as Kanchu, I'd like to say here that you are talking to that 10%. And you, the Sorry? reason you are here is because we want to do something about it. You are talking to the 10%, not to the 90%. Okay, 10%, let us see, 10%. So I, don't know I think what you what should respect are, us because we have, we have otherwise no other reason. We have no other reason other than love for our country to talk. And, and that's why we so are... Then when you talk to the 90%, I will be with you to talk like that. And, and that's why we are hearing you, Mr. Karju. We are all, you know, believe what you believe today. I, um, I yes. believe in speaking the truth. Yeah. I can tell you one thing. The truth... See, let me tell you one thing. If 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 hurts you, and you want... You say that, sir, please don't say 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 because it hurts me. Say, please say 2 plus 2 is equal to 5 or 2 plus 2 is equal to 6. My answer is, I'm not going to say, it. I, I, I have no desire to please you. Please I, understand, I, don't I have no desire to please you. I will speak I, the truth, whether whether it hurts you or whether it pleases you. It makes no difference to me. I will um, never say 2 plus 2 is equal to 5. I don't think, to, ju no, Justice, Justice like Kaju, let me, let me stop you. I'm uh, not totally. saying, we are not saying you should say what we want to hear. All we are saying is that, yes, it is completely true 
that many NRIs are promoting. But we have this forum where there are people from all over this country who are listening, who are trying to find some way that they could better show their dissent from what's going on in India, whether it's Hindus for Human Rights, International Society. There are many, many societies like that, many organizations that want to help. But what they want to know from you as an Indian jurist is what are the kinds of things they can do? I understand there are other people who don't believe in, um, you know, in what we believe in, but there's nothing we can do about that. We want to do what we can. So we are asking for some practical guidance on what we can do as Indians in the diaspora. I believe that. Well, I gave you one guidance. You, you should support the demand for uh, an investigation into yes. atrocities on minorities in India that should be investigated. This is happening with impunity uh, it's because the authorities in, in, inside India, uh, instead of taking action against the perpetrators of lynching and other crimes on minorities, they are often persecuting the victims' families. So you people should uh, uh, take up this issue and demand an, an, an investigation by foreign agencies into the, the what is happening. <laughs> Just imagine this this uh, pregnant woman, Sarfura, Safura Zargar. You may have you may read about her in the internet. Yes. yes. All she did was that she was very active in the anti um, um, this uh, citizenship amendment act agitation. Every, and because she was a Muslim, that makes a double fault in her. And trumped up charges were levied, have been levied against her that she was uh, inciting communal violence in Delhi, in those Delhi riots, and, which are all false. See, police can manufacture anything. What is, but, the police will but, do whatever the politician, political masters will tell, tell them to do. The polit, but, Indian police itself, nowadays, I'm sorry to say, Indian police has, is not neutral, it has no shame. It, was, it will shamelessly obey the orders of their political masters. Yes. And political and masters I, say that you file cases against these people. I, I totally agree with you that we, there should be investigation. But the Indian government doesn't want to allow any investigating bodies in. How can anyone investigate anything if they are not even allowed in? What can we do about uh, maybe pressuring the government to let them in? I'm saying you, you, you build up a movement in, in, in America uh, and supporting the demand for an investigation. You people should support the demand uh, that uh, an investigation should be made uh, by an uh, independent body. Maybe it, if it's not by the US Commission on Religious Freedom, it may be by some other independent body, but investigation must be made because what is happening in India are terrible things. Well, I, I have a question that's not so much uh, related to what we can do. Do you believe that parliament has the right to remove the word secular and socialist from the preamble to the Con Indian constitution? Because they were obviously added during the time of the emergency. Listen, first get your concepts clear. Please, please. I mean, you people don't even have your concepts clear. Now, please let me clarify your point. I have to teach you ABCD. Now, listen to me. Secularism is a feature of industrial society. It is not a feature of feudal or semi-feudal society. India is still semi-feudal. It is not feudal, but it is still semi-feudal. Although the, the word secularism is mentioned in the constitution, but the ground reality is very different. The ground reality is that India is a highly communal country. Most Hindus are communal and most Muslims are communal. Let me tell you, when I am sitting with my relatives and Hindu friends, and they are sure there is no Muslim present, they often spout venom against the Muslims. I have to keep quiet at that time. I am I'm, I'm in the minority. And when a Muslim is lynched, hardly any, it, it does not, hardly any Hindu is bothered. They are indifferent or some are happy that one terrorist less. <laughs> so, India is a highly communal country. Please, see, don't go by, supposing in the constitution it is mentioned that India is a very prosperous country. Or India, everybody in India speaks truth. 
See, writing, you may write anything in the constitution. If constitution is a piece of paper, it means nothing. What is the ground yeah. reality? The ground reality is India is a highly communal country. Most Hindus are communal. 80 to 90 percent Hindus are communal and 80 to 90 percent Muslims are also communal. This is the re reality. Then let me ask you this question. Do you believe that children in India can be taught to be secular? Or is religious fundamentalism here to stay and there's nothing that can be done with respect to the next Sorry, generation? I did not get your question. What is your question? I said, do you believe that children who live in India, Indian children, can be taught children. secularism? Or are we just, you know, we have no recourse but to go ahead with the religious communalism or fundamentalism, however you want to describe it. Is there any hope for the children? Children? Yes, the children, the next generation. No, no, what are you asking? I'm not able to follow. I'm saying, are you, do, are you hopeful or do you know of any way that secular education can be promulgated Madam, to the children of India? Madam, you are not aware of what is happening in India. Let me tell you. Let, I'm living in India. You are living in America. So let me tell you. In large number of schools, I'm not saying 100%, large number of schools, there's so much polarization in Indian society on religious ground that many Hindu children, and they are the majority, they tell their Muslim classmates that Muslims are terrorists, Muslims are anti-nationals, Pakistanis. Some children ask their class, Muslim classmates, does your father manufacture bombs? This is the situation in India. Their minds have been poisoned. Please don't suffer from illusions. And as regards uh, students, they are as uh, casteist and communal as anybody. And let me tell you, even about the uh, educated people, leave aside uh, illiterate. I was invited to Dehradun University. Now, here this very interesting thing. There was a huge crowd of almost 400 people in the hall. Uh, and in fact, one or 200 people were even standing. Packed hall. I, was, I had to speak on the constitution. So uh, in the front row, there were these professors of Dehradun University sitting with lovely suits and ties. Some of them having degrees from maybe Harvard, Yale, or London School of Economics. Then behind them were these associate professors or assistant professors and so on. And behind them were all these students, boys and girls, 400 or more. And I said, you can... Here my speech, if you go on YouTube and just type Justice Kaju Dehradun, you'll get it. I said, these professors of yours who are sitting in front with lovely ties and suits and lady professors wearing lovely sarees and whatnot and having degrees from Harvard and Yale. I said, just now I will prove them that they have got cow dung in their heads. I, within two minutes, I will prove it. You can hear my speech. And I said, all right. Ask them if their daughter wants to marry a Dalit, will they give consent? Not one will give consent. And some will, in fact, get their daughter murdered, honor killing. These professors, I'm not talking to uneducated people, mind you. Their heads are full of casteism. These professors with PhD from Harvard, PhD from Yale. I'm not impressed by these PhDs. A lot of idiots have come out of Harvard and Yale also. The point is, what do you have in your head? You have casteism, communalism. You look down on a section of your own people. They, they regard Dalits as inferior. Is this not the truth? You people living in America, you claim to be very uh, educated. I, I know of instances where, you know, the physical fights have taken place in America on caste basis. You people we, we are said, as casteist. It is we, said that even if you, these, these, these NRIs, they go to... The, Mars, the planet Mars, they will take this shit along with them, this casteism. You are full of, your heads are full of cram with casteism. And I said, these professors in Dehradun University, many of them having PhDs from London School of Economic and Harvard and Yale, and their heads are full of casteism. Just imagine in the year 1776, in the American Declaration of Independence, it was said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. But you people in the year 2020 say, no, Dalits are our inferiors. 
and when they, they are maybe 20 to 25 percent of your population maybe 25 25 30 crore just imagine a person who looks down on a section of his own people does this does his head not have gobar i said in ka khopde mein gobar bhara hai cow dung and that we is certainly like appreciate we certainly appreciate your honesty no, and frankness you are casteist this is the truth even sitting in america you are casteist I know, course, I know people I've don't... been to America many times. I know you people are also castes. There is one people... uh, among Telugu people, people, mind you, there's one Telugu gentleman sitting here. Let me tell you, when there's one Telugu association of North America, Tana, consisting of um, Kammas, and there's one Nata, North American <laughs> Telugu association consisting of Reddies, and Wait. they had a cricket match and there was physical fight in California. Wait. Are, we don't talk, we do you, appreciate you utterly castes we, even sitting in America you are utterly castes we don't we appreciate lecture. your frankness and now if there are no other questions um, are there any other questions from anyone that I have not um, somehow read or know about is is there anybody who would like to ask a different question in yeah. that case we we would like to thank you very much no, I have a for for your your presence here and for your frankness you've always been known for your fearless expression of what you feel and you certainly have a right to express that uh, we on the other hand are trying to help ourselves to quick, to uh, to somehow combat these tendencies but we will certainly um, we certainly appreciate your being here um, Thank you. Do you have any other question, anyone? No, thank you so much, uh, Sharmila ji, for moderating. I would like I to thank uh, Justice uh, Markanda Kaju for taking uh, the opportunity and time at this late hour of the night in India on my invitation. Um, to sum up, uh, Justice Kaju, this group of people in minorities sitting on this conference call has their own struggles. And uh, while generalizing the NRI state of affairs, you have stated well that everybody, 99%, I would say, going beyond 90, I would say 99% of them are casteist. The people who are sitting here have their own fights. Sunita ji, Raju Rajkopal ji, Hindus for Human Rights have stood along the protesters, a uh, few protesters at the Howdy Modi. Of course, the media won't cover it. We at Indian Americans Forum invited you to air your thoughts and we give uh, under the freedom of expression everybody their right to speak and it is very distressing to know the current state of affairs from the jurist like you and we certainly um, appreciate your frankness but I wanted to end the note um, with some uh, popular uh, you know uh, introduction of the people who are on this panel we invited, we are in minority uh, justice, Markanda Kaju. We are not amongst those who 99% of the NRIs are. We certainly fight for justice. We certainly fi fight for injustices around the world. We fight for injustices and casteism, and we stand uh, secular. We try to protect the preamble of the constitution. So I appreciate your time so much. And I really thank Justice Markanda Kaju for taking this and uh, Sharmila ji um, for moderating, Sunita ji uh, and Raju Rajgopal ji from Hindus for Human Rights, Nursing ji, Dr. Rehan Khan, and the people who are behind the screen, Ramakrishna Jalla and uh, Iqbal and other people, Dr. Manisha from UK. And I see Kapil Chowski, Aisha, Balaji Narsimhan, Panna Batra, Fasi, and uh, uh, many more people. Um, these are those people in minorities, uh, but we stand with your thought process. That's the reason why we brought you here, and we appreciate your talk. Thank you so much. Justice. Can I have one question, please? Thank Good night. Can I have Thank one you. question, please? Who is this? I'm, I'm Dr. Mahesh Band. Actually, I was trying to post it in the group. So we are closing. Can... We are closing, Dr. Mahesh. So sorry about that. We are our No, let him ask the question. Is what is the let him ask. He wants to ask a question. Let him ask. Thank so you. We are closing. Thank we you, are, Mr. Our Kajur. Zoom call is Zoom call is ending. So I apologize. Uh, our time is up. So please let him ask a question. What is the harm? I'm sorry. Uh, we have to end the call because of the time constraint. Uh, we can post that question. We can get that question and post to you directly. You can reply for him. So we can give uh, Mr. Kaju's email to you, Mr. Banda. 
so please ask him thank you please uh, please be short other because we are already running short of time i think uh, you know we decided not to extend this call because of the zoom I mean, limitation so it's not so great uh, mr uh, jamal jamil whatever you know i spent two hours of my time over here and you didn't give me one question to ask when the i mean like person want to ready to answer that but well like you know that's the case like you know that's the case thank you dr mahesh i apologize uh, you no know, you don't I, need to apologize you know that sorry about that and uh, we will end the call sorry about that okay thank you thank all thank you so much thank you dr justice kachu and thank others you thank you so much for their questions bye bye thank you all thank you thank you you want anything say to say kadju sir no thank you thank you okay so i'm winding up officially yeah thank you justice kadju for taking my call good night thank what you what is the question you ask let him ask the question because oh, we are running uh, we are running short we oh come we on one question it. will not matter let him ask i think he disconnected justice i will send you the question later okay thank you so much because uh, the zoom call is uh, ending in one minute okay thank you sir thank you for your time good night thank you for taking the call when will you send me the link yes when i will, will send, send you right now i will send okay, you right now the you. facebook send it facebook. send it by email send it by oh. email okay okay thank you thank you sir thank you good night thank you welcome welcome good night good night